We are just waiting for the ranking member who is on his way. Thank you. Good morning, the committee will come to order. I thank everyone for joining us this morning and I want to especially thank the witnesses who have traveled from across the country to be here with us today. When I talk to small business owners, one of the first things they mention to me is that access to capital is the lifeblood of their business. Affordable capital fuels new startups and helps existing businesses expand into new markets and grow their customer bases. And we know that when capital is accessible and on fair terms, small businesses can do what they, what they do best, strengthen our communities and fuel our economy. Unfortunately, affordable capital can be hard to come by for many owners, whether it is a taxi cab driver in New York City pursuing the American dream or a small business owner trying to make payroll, predatory lenders has been targeting individuals and small businesses with loans that have excessively high interest rates and unfair and abusive terms. This is an ongoing problem in many areas of lending and today's hearing will highlight one aspect of this larger issue. In recent years, cash advance firms have been offering small businesses short-term loans that have the equivalent of a 400% or more annualized interest rate. Many of these firms then require borrowers to sign a confession of judgment just to get the money. Because cash flow is so vital to a business survival, many owners feel they have no choice but to sign away the rights to save their businesses and provide for their employees. By signing, borrowers essentially waive their legal rights regarding any legal dispute that might arise. And if one does arise, the lender can unilaterally declare a default and take actions against the small business owner. In doing so, these lenders have hijacked our courts by getting rubber stamp judgments without notice or hearings. Many times, small business borrowers only find out about a judgment against them after the lender begins to seize bank accounts or other assets. Over the past few years, lenders have used these instruments to win more than 32,000 judgments in state courts. While confessions of judgment have been prohibited under the Truth in Lending Act for consumer loans since 1985, these protections do not extend to certain types of commercial loans. That is why I introduced the Small Business Lending Fairness Act, which will put an end to these predatory collection practices. By ending confessions of judgment in commercial lending, we can stop some of the abuses that are crippling honest small business owners. I find it appalling that New York State law has made our state a magnet for dishonest lenders. And I am encouraged 
by the news that the New York State lawmakers are now taking steps to prevent these out-of-state lenders from using our court system to freeze and drain a borrower's account. But this is not enough, which is why I'm working with Senator Brown to close this loophole nationally. As, pre as predatory small business lenders continue to evolve and find creative ways around the law, Congress must similarly be proactive in addressing those predatory practices and rooting out abuses that are harming honest, hardworking small business borrowers. Closing this loophole ensures that pre predatory lenders cannot use abuse, abusive practices to seize the assets of small firms without due process and protects them when they are looking to obtain a loan. Again, I want to thank the witnesses for being here, and I now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Shabbat, for his opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. And before I, I get into the uh, substance of my uh, uh, opening statement this morning, I just wanted to note uh, the passing of a former chairman uh, of this committee. Um, when I was first elected in uh, 1994 and sworn in in 95, uh, the Democrats had controlled the House for 40 years at that time, so all the chairmen uh, and chairwomen of those committees were Democrats, and so Republicans in 95 became the chairs, and the uh, chairwoman of this committee uh, was Jan Myers, and uh, she's actually up on the, her portrait's up on the wall in red up there. Uh, Jan was a great member of Congress, great chair uh, of this uh, uh, committee. Um, she was 90 years old when she passed away. She represented Kansas. Uh, and uh, did a great job, and, and uh, so we want to recognize her, her leadership, and, and uh, we wish the best to her family, and uh, she's held in very high, high esteem. Would you yield for a I'd second? I'd be happy to yield. Thank you. And uh, I issued a statement, a press statement yesterday, and she represented the spirit of bipartisanship of this committee. We are here discussing issues that are important to the small business community and uh, for, for her and for us. They are not Republicans or Democratic issues. Uh, she came here, she did her job, and uh, was very fair, very smart, and committed to serve small businesses in our nation. I yield back. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Reclaim my time. I, I just got a notice uh, from the uh, former members of Congress uh, that I still am a member because I lost back in 08. So uh, I joined the former members of Congress, and I'm still a member. I don't think they ever know I got reelected again. So, <laughs> but anyway, it indicated that Jan had passed away, and uh, so she was a great member. And I think we were both following in her footsteps, the uh, former chair and uh, the current chair and me as a former chair. So uh, rest in peace, Jan. She's a, she's a great lady. Um, as our economy uh, continues to roar ahead with record unemployment rates and near record uh, small business optimism, our nation's smallest firms still face obstacles when it comes to financing uh, their projects and growth. With an onslaught of new technologies, leaders are reaching small businesses, uh, entrepreneurs, and startups in novel ways. Uh, despite new technological platforms, the contract uh, between two parties is still where the rubber meets the road. Often these contracts contain a legal provision that we're discussing here today. Although confessions of judgment have been around for ages, the provision has received increased attention recently at the federal and state level due to some abuses. Specifically, the provision allows a party to waive his or her due process rights, bypass litigation, and move immediately towards a monetary judgment. At the federal level, the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, is one of the nation's agencies that oversees consumer protection laws. In 1984, the FTC determined that the use of confessions of judgments should be prohibited in all consumer contracts. Although the FTC, through regulation, banned confessions of judgment in consumer contracts, they elected not to include business contracts in that prohibition. States, on the other hand, have created a patchwork of rules on how to treat confessions of judgment from an outright ban in some states to allowing them in others. Many of the states that do allow them, such as my state, Ohio, and Pennsylvania, also require certain guardrails and safeguards to protect parties involved in these transactions. For example, in Ohio, warning language must appear on the contract in bold and, quote, distinctive, unquote, lettering. Uh, 
These safeguards help reduce the chances of small business owners not being aware of the provision and or not understanding the provision, which often leads towards abusive practices. Most recently, just last week, the state of New York, as was mentioned, voted to ban all out-of-state confessions of judgment. I look forward to hearing from all four of our witnesses uh, here today about the history of this provision and how, how it has been utilized in recent years. Additionally, I'm interested in hearing how states have regulated this legal tool. As we continue to work to create an environment that allows small businesses to grow, create jobs, and flourish, it's important to look at how states address various issues, including this one. So I want to thank the witnesses for joining us today, just as the chairwoman did, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Shabbat. The gentleman yields back. Uh, and now I recognize the gentle lady from Kansas, uh, Ms. Davis, uh, for the purpose of making a statement on Ms. Meyer's passing. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, one, just acknowledge the importance of Jan Myers for the state of Kansas and particularly for the district I now represent. She was certainly um, uh, a leader in our state and as uh, a woman in elected uh, leadership, I appreciated her ability to um, act in a bipartisan way and uh, bring what I consider to be Midwestern values and pragmatism to uh, not just politics, but to our society in general. Uh, I appreciate the time, just wanted to uh, express that uh, Jan Myers was such an important figure in uh, Kansas history. Thank you. The gentle lady yields back. Um, and if committee members have an opening statement, we will ask they be submitted for the record. I would like to just take a minute to explain the timing rules. Each witness gets five minutes to testify, and members get five minutes for questioning. There is a lighting system to assist you. The green light comes on when you begin, and the yellow light means there is one minute remaining. The red light comes on when you are out of time, and we ask that you stay within that time frame to the best of your ability. I would now like to introduce our witnesses. Our first witness is Professor Hosea Harvey, PhD. Professor Harvey has taught at Temple University's Law School since 2010, where he teaches contracts, banking, and financial regulation, and consumer law matters, focusing on how our nation's banking laws impact diverse communities. His work is particularly timely as we, uh, as we consider confessions of judgment in the context of small business lending and the role that Congress can play to ensure a fair marketplace. Professor Harvey earned his BA from Dartmouth College and then went on to Stanford University where he received his MA, JD, uh, and his PhD in political science. Welcome, Professor Harvey and you're recognized for five. I'm going to introduce all the members uh, all at once, and then we, we will start. Our second witness is Mr. Jerry Bush. Mr. Bush is a 28-year certified master plumber from Roanoke. Roanoke, Virginia. He owned JB Plumbing and Heating of Virginia with his father, but was recently forced to shut down after 30 years of business due to abusive confessions of judgment associated with cash advances. Mr. Bush is also a ded dedicated public servant, having served as a volunteer fire chief of 425 years. He currently lives in Roner with his wife of 19 years, who is a cancer survivor and their 18-year-old son. Welcome, Mr. Bush. Our third witness today is Mr. Shane Haskin. He is a partner in the Philadelphia office of White & Williams LLP, a full-service regional law firm with over 240 lawyers in 10 offices. Mr. Haskin practices in the firm's commercial litigation department and has nearly 20 years of experience litigating complex matter. Mr. Heskin holds a JD from Albany Law School and a BA from Mayville State University, where he graduated summa cum laude from both schools. Since 2016, Mr. Heskin has represented more than 50 small businesses and individuals in connection with high-interest lending products located all over the country. Welcome. 
And now I would like to yield to our ranking member, Mr. Shabo, to introduce our fit, uh, final witness. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our next uh, witness will be Benjamin Picker. Mr. Picker is a shareholder and attorney at the law firm of McCausland, Keene, and Buckman in Devon, Pennsylvania, which is outside Philadelphia. Uh, he's an experienced contract securities and consumer protection litigator and has tried cases in both state and federal courts. Mr. Picker holds a Bachelor of Arts from the University of Maryland, and his law degree is from uh, Temple University's Beasley School of Law. And we want to thank him for being here. We want to thank all the witnesses for being here. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Harvey, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman Velasquez, Ranking Member Shabbat, and members of the committee. My name is Jose L. Harvey, and I'm a law professor and a consumer law aficionado. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss confessions of judgment and the proposed Small Business Lending Fairness Act. I'm here today in my individual capacity and not as a representative of my institution. As you know, a confession of judgment in its simplest form is simply a contractual arrangement by which a borrower slash debtor agrees to forfeit the right to contest a declaration of default. As you also know, the U.S. Supreme Court in 1972 held that with respect to business transactions, confessions of judgment are not per se unconstitutional. As a result of that Supreme Court decision, a patchwork of state laws has remained to this day. As you also know, and we heard earlier in 1985, the FTC did ban confessions of judgment through the credit practices rule for certain consumer credit provisions. But despite the FTC's action, Congress did not choose to extend this prohibition to business transactions at that time. Perhaps this choice was informed by a belief that business to business transactions take place between sophisticated parties on equal footing. However, the recent Bloomberg News investigation reminds us that that's not always true. By postulating that business to business transactions are often, if not always, on equal commercial footing, we ignore insights from consumer transactional research about how power dynamics and predatory behavior might influence contract terms. We would also falsely expect that businesses always knowingly engage in commercial transactions and that the inattention to fine print that consumers often utilize is somehow different when that consumer is a small business. But in a world in which thousands of drivers for your app ride-based shares, long word there, have their own business and can finance their enterprise with a business loan, perhaps the theoretical line between consumer and business credit transactions has blurred over time. 1099 filings have increased in recent years, 25% in the past two decades. Almost 100 million 1099s were filed in a recent tax year. In short, our conventional understanding of what a small business is should evolve, just as, our, just as our economy has evolved over time. Sometimes a singular consumer is also a small business. The law should reflect that. I do acknowledge that confessions of judgment in business transactions have a limited purpose if exercised with caution and restraint. However, the space is rife with abuse and open for substantial reform. There is also not compelling evidence that eliminating them in the commercial context will have a chilling effect on credit acquisition either, although that is a good talking point for folks that oppose uh, reform. The reason why reform is important right now is that the state level approach to commercial confessions of judgment is a fraying patchwork quilt and more procedure than substance. Here, Congress did play a role. Congress chose to somewhat artificially segregate the way we think about the regulation of consumer credit transactions from commercial credit transactions. That transactional marginal line reinforces the perception that businesses are on equal footing, are all equally sophisticated, and that market forces are the best to curb predatory behavior. I think the Small Business Lending Fairness Act appropriately eliminates this false dichotomy between consumer and business transactions. We don't yet know the full scope of abuse in this space. The lack of research is what made the Bloomberg investigation so noteworthy and impressive. But this committee can still ask whether federal consumer law prohibitions that we find unfair in one context can be extended to business transactions that might also be unfair. I think those prohibitions should be extended. Why? They will bring uniformity and consistency to a space that needs it. It could also reduce disparate outcomes, such as the ones you'll hear about today. The business models of companies that are egregious offenders would suffer, which may be appropriate if you think they engage in unfair practices. Given what we know, the Small Business Lending Fairness Act rests on sound evidentiary footing. It codifies and extends the FTC's ban on consumer confessions of judgment 
to include small business owners as well. Chairwoman Velasquez, joined by Representative Marshall, Senators Rubio and Brown and others, does recognize the contractual prohibitions, excuse me, provisions that deny due process can punish small businesses and serve no compelling purpose. By amending TILA to include a general prohibition on confessions of judgment for businesses, Congress can act to prevent the abuses described here today. This proposed solution is neither partisan nor anti-business. In short, just before, just hours before the 50th anniversary of the implementation of the Truth in Lending Act, this committee's consideration of the Small Business Lending Fairness Act is an important, logical, and necessary extension of TILA's original principles and purpose. I thank the committee for its efforts and for the opportunity to testify this morning. Thank you, Mr. Harvey. You. Mr. Bush, you are recognized for five minutes. Hello, my name is Jerry Bush, and I want to thank the committee and, and the chairwoman and everybody for this, please. I am the former owner of J.B. Plumbing and Heating in Virginia. My father built J.B. Plumbing and Heating of Virginia 30 years ago so he could give life for his family. When I graduated from high school, I was given a work truck tool so I could one day support my family like he did. My father served the Army, and when his term done, he came out and started to be a plumber. He had to do everything from scratch, and he was never given anything. As I took interest in the company, we incorporated 2008. We had a very strong company, and when the house market crashed, it hurt us pretty bad, but we had a good name and never had to look for work. We started doing more commercial work and mainly done all new work, and sometimes you would have to wait 60 days to get your money and a year after the job to complete and receive your 10% retainage. When we done a large project in 2015 and was not paid around $350,000, this put us in a bad position as we tried to fight this contractor. We had personal guarantees that we had to pay suppliers and other subs in which this caused us to have judgments. I went to our bank, Wells Fargo, and they turned us down turned us down for a loan, but the gentleman told me he knew some brokers, and within a week I received a call from a broker telling me they could help. I was at the point where I, I was hoping to win the lawsuit with the contractor who owed us money, plus I had to keep payroll going and the jobs because of contracts. The, bro the broker said we can get a better deal within 45 days that you had to earn their trust, so I said okay. They sent me the contract, and I'd never seen a confession of judgment before and asked about it, and they said it's just a case you run away or change accounts or we cannot find you. Um, and, and they never would use them. They would work with you, and then they would do a funny company call from the lender as if the broker told you, asked you if the broker told you everything, and they will work with you if you run into problems. Nobody explained what all they could do if they want to. 30 days go by and I was paying my dailies and the broker comes back and said, hey, I have a sweet deal. I found another company will be there for a long haul and said my contract says if I take enough funding, I, I will go into fault. They respond saying, no, you're good, we got you. Then when the time came around for the um, first one to end, the funding company will call and say, hey, are you ready to renew? And when you tell them no, they go into account and see you're working with somebody else and they force you to renew or default. So then you got start to have two daily payments and then you keep getting deeper. And next thing you know, they are taking $18,000 out daily. They know every day how much you bring in and everything else. And mostly all made hundreds of thousands off of us and the amounts of the judgment show that they went back and started to advance again. Example, if you had $10,000 left and the advance was 50000 but the contract amount was 70000 they would take 10000 and add 70000 because they said it's in the contract to restart, then they add equal legal fees up to 34000 and more than the judgment showed, 114000 plus the 60000 you already had taken out or pay them, and this is a good reason for them to pay people like New York Marshals because they can force to get it. When the time came where I needed help to get the payments reduced, I did not want to take any more funds, and funds were tight because $18,000 at $90,000 weekly. I asked for reduced payments from Yellowstone, and they would only make you take a funding contract and no money, and in return, they would still charge the 400% like 
like Last Chance and Main Street. They will give reduced payments for five days and come back in a week or so and say with no warning and take the money out. August the 7th, 2018, when I had to make a choice of getting, 2018, when I had to make a choice to keep getting deeper closed doors, I warned all the funding companies it was going to happen. That Tuesday, I had to tell employees and my fathers it was over, and I had to tell the contractors as well. To my father's face and to watch 20 employees, everybody still haunts me. The chain reaction was awful. Personal guarantees frozen accounts. Certain people was holding equipment, tools, and hostages. Our name was smeared. At, I was at the end. The funding companies even took my father's retirement and money that was from his Social Security around end of August 2018. I had companies tell me two ways out, win the lottery, or if you die, we can't come after you. When all this was going on, I closed doors, and after my wife was going through cancer, one day in January 2018, I didn't want to renew a loan, and the gentleman from one of the funding companies, Yellowstone, said if I do not, he would default me. I told him I was at my wife's chemo treatment, and his words was, I will send flyers and to, to make her feel better. The day when I was asked at my dark place, when I was at with my dark place, I said I would win. I would not let them take my family no more. I sat on the bank and said to myself, I want my, to see my son grow up. I want to be there for my family, but I cannot take care of them. If I never have anything, I would have the right, and if I was gone, they, came, they can't come after me no more. I was not looking for a way out. I was looking for a way to fix it, and I did. It was my fault. I said my goodbyes on Facebook, begging people to make sure my family was okay and did the hardest thing I ever had to do and took appeals. I did not do anything, and I really, and hid myself heavy in the woods and went to sleep. But as I look now, I was lucky, and I was found. My second chance was about a month. I started to fight again, see my father, age 70, back to hard labor and not the best health and how these companies were making millions. Pictures of them in sports cars, fancy trips, tables of cash they had taken from people all over the country. Every man, every woman, every race. I started to make calls, sending emails. No local news would hear me, and nobody could understand even local laws. Can I finish? Or? Uh, how much more? Less than a minute. Okay. Last okay. paragraph. Uh, Thank you. I had one lawyer from New York contact me to Bloomberg News, and the story came out and still missed a lot of details, but this was a good start, and when the story came out, funding companies hit harder. They did all kinds of crazy stuff. They sent letters to credit cards with Discovery and asked and received any kind of bank account numbers, and they used to freeze my accounts. So with this, I can never have a bank account and will have judgments on my records and personal guarantees. Um, basically, I'd just like to say is that um, I can never have a count, anything. Um, they have judgments, and um, this has been hard on my whole family. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Bush. And now, Mr. Heskin, you recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Chairwoman, Chairwoman Velasquez, Ranking Member Chabot, and the other distinguished members of the committee. <clears throat> America's small businesses are under attack by predatory lenders, that are the business equivalent of payday lending. As New York's highest court described it more than 50 years ago, it is the equivalent of sending someone into a battle like a warrior of old by discarding their shield and breaking their sword. I second the testimony by Professor Harvey. Not every small business or every transaction that involves a business means that they are sophisticated parties. My clients are very good at what they do. They know how to fix a boat. They know how to install a sink. They know how to make a fine wine. All things I can't do. But that doesn't mean they know how to read a contract in eight-point font. It doesn't mean they know the legal ramifications of signing a confession of judgment. It certainly doesn't mean that they understand that they could wake up one morning and have their bank accounts drained by a New York City marshal making over $1.8 million a year on small businesses when they need that money for payroll. 
Let me encourage the committee to look at exhibit number six to my written testimony. It is a sample of 500 small businesses that have been victimized by the COJ. It's by one company. It, it contains victims, a winery from California, a craft brewery from Colorado, a nail salon from Ohio, a diner from Minnesota, a coffee shop from Texas. That's the definition of Main Street. They're under attack, and they need help. And it's not just the unsophisticated. It preys on even the most sophisticated. I have here with me today Cara DiPietro. She was the Small Business Administration's Small Business Person of the Year in 2017. In 2018, she was listed as one of the fastest growing small businesses in the country. She got preyed upon just last month where she was fully complying with the terms of her contract with an MCA company and she woke up and found her business accounts frozen. Why? Because she had the audacity to question an MCA company and say, why are you taking out so much money? My revenues are declining and you're taking double and triple the money. Stop it. Their reaction, freeze their bank accounts, send a COJ in, and here's the next point. It leads right into the next point. There's more work to do. New York spanning the COJ is a great first step. Great first step. But guess what? Ms. DiPietro was victimized by Pennsylvania, a Pennsylvania COJ and a Pennsylvania sheriff froze her bank accounts before she even had notice. We need to do more. We need to stop it now. Not tomorrow, now. Otherwise, the rest of America, there will be more small business victims, just like sophisticated business and unsophisticated businesses. Now, the next weapon is already here. The next weapon of the MCA industry is the UCC. I don't know what can be done about it, but it's just as lethal. They, for the cost of a stamp, they can send a letter to PayPal, to credit card processors, to your best company, and halt business in your track. Drain your credit card processors, drain your PayPal account, and ruin your relationship that you've built with one of your best customers. That has to be addressed. Also, the next, the next iteration of the, C, uh, of the MCA industry is also here. It's rent a bank. I, I respectfully submit that you look into that as well. Um, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Peaker, you are now recognized for five minutes. Chairwoman Velasquez, Ranking Member Shabat, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to be here today to testify and they discuss the history, law, uses, and important due process and fairness considerations relating to confessions of judgment. I want to start off by saying that I do not disagree with anything that our other witnesses have said so far, absolutely nothing. My experience is not specifically with the MCA industry. It is more generally with the use of confessions of judgment in commercial uh, transactions and litigation. Uh, as has been testified to already, a confession of judgment clause is a contractual provision permitting the plaintiff to take a judgment against a purportedly defaulting defendant without prior notice and before commencement of a lawsuit, thereby skipping the entire normal litigation process. This concept of confession of judgment has been around and dates back to perhaps the 13th century. So it's been around for a very long time, as the chairwoman mentioned. During my nearly 15 years as a practicing law, a large part of which has been litigating business disputes, I have both utilized and defended against confessed judgments. When asked if I like confessions of judgment as a tool, my response is usually, well, it depends on who's using it, me or the other guy. That's because it's a very powerful tool, but it can be abused 
in the wrong hands. However, when used in appropriate circumstances, it is often a far less expensive way to reach the same result that would have been reached after years of costly and needless litigation. In my home state, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, confessions of judgment are permitted, but only in connection with commercial transactions. They're prohibited in consumer contracts, such as residential leases, and of course, as we know, in consumer financing transactions. In most states, confession of judgment is generally prohibited. It should be noted that through the credit practices rule, which was promulgated in 1985, the FTC outlawed the use of confession of judgment in consumer credit transactions. The primary reasons for doing so were one, consumers often suffer substantial economic and emotional injury from the use of confession of judgment in consumer credit transactions. Two, consumer credit transactions are often contracts of adhesion where the individual consumers have little or no negotiating power. Three, consumers did not understand the provisions. And four, default usually occurred because of issues beyond a consumer's control, such as unemployment or illness. I can see that many of those same concerns are present in the small business context, especially when you're talking about MCAs. As Mr. Heskin said in a different way, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court has described confessions of judgment as, quote, perhaps the most powerful and drastic document known to civil law. As a result, states that permit confessions of judgment, including Pennsylvania, require that the provision be placed conspicuously within the contract, that certain formalities be strictly followed, and that there be a way for the defendant to challenge the judgment after the fact. A warrant of attorney or confession of judgment clause that is bolded or capitalized will ordinarily be sufficiently conspicuous. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court has compared a non-conspicuous confession of judgment clause to actions of the Roman tyrant Caligula, who is said to have had the laws inscribed upon pillars so high that the people could not read them. Regarding formalities, for example, confessions of judgment in Pennsylvania must be accompanied by a, compl a complaint describing paragraph by paragraph the factual basis for the judgment and must attach a copy of the instrument or contract permitting the confession of judgment. In addition, an affidavit must be included attesting to the fact that the defendant has income of more than $10,000. The confessed judgment is filed subject to the misdemeanor penalty relating to the criminal offense of unsworn falsification to authorities. In some counties, like my home county of Montgomery County in Pennsylvania, the court clerk known as the prothonotary has its legal counsel even review all confessions of judgment before they're accepted for filing to ensure that they comport with all legal requirements. This can serve to protect both the plaintiff and the prothonotary from lawsuits. The confession of judgment procedure in Pennsylvania also comports with the constitutional guarantee of due process, according to the Supreme Court. It requires knowing and voluntary relinquishment of pre-deprivation process, and provides a procedure for challenging the confessed judgment. A confessed judgment can be challenged by filing a petition with the court within 30 days of receiving notice of the judgment. It can be stricken, where there's a clear defect on the face of the papers, and can be opened, where the defendant shows that it has a meritorious defense. As I mentioned earlier, confessions of judgment can be abused in the wrong hands. Uh, but there are some common sense ways that Congress could act to protect small business borrowers against unscrupulous lenders while protecting the interests of lenders who act appropriately. I would get into that, but it appears that I'm out of time. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to all the witnesses for uh, all the information and compelling stories that, that you have shared with us today. Uh, I would like to uh, start uh, with you, Mr. Bush. Um, I am really particularly concerned uh, that victims of confession of judgment are denied due process and not giving any notice before legal action is taken against them. So, Mr. Bush, I would like to ask you, how do you find out your accounts have been uh, seized and your money gone? Um, a couple of reasons. Um, how do you find out? Normally, I check my account. Um, I normally check my accountants in the morning through online, or I turn around and have a employer somebody said a check that has happened. Um, now, I normally might get a letter from a bank, but that's two weeks after it happened. Did any entity give you notice, or did you only find out once your account has been drained? No notice. No notice. Uh, Mr. Hes uh, Heskin, 
You have fought numerous uh, COJ battles in court on behalf of victims. How often are vi uh, victims given notice that their assets, such as bank accounts, must, um, might be seized? Hardly ever. And, and in fact, it's the rare occasion that they do get notice. A lot of times they will threaten my clients and say, with a push of the button, I will drain your bank accounts. Mr. Heskin, um, Professor Harvey, do you think if a small business knew they could have their accounts drained as a result of signing a confession of judgment, they will have agreed to the cash advance? Mr. Harvey. Um, almost always, no. Uh, I think they would be very uh, wary of that, particularly if they're in a precarious financial condition, as many folks who, who take these loans or advances are. Thank you. Uh, uh, does this mean that there is potentially no meetings of the minds here between the parties, which, as I understand, is needed for a valid contract? Uh, since I teach contracts, that's a great question. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I think that that's true, that there is a certain gap in understanding about what the contractual instrument is. And I think the law can, can, change, can change that, right? When we have provisions that uh, we think are important, we can highlight them, we can bold them, we can demand additional accountability. Thank you. Um, Mr. Heskin, have you seen the use of confessions of judgment in any other circumstance, such as an instances where the borrower isn't as vulnerable? I've never seen it in any of my commercial transactions. I represent primarily insurance companies, and we certainly do not use the confession of judgment. Uh, Mr. Bush, I understand you eventually paid around $600,000 to obtain around 250000 for your business. Were you ever made aware that you would have to pay back three times the amount you borrowed? If I understand correctly, yes, I, I was aware as far as what I had to pay back was on a contract, but what I was not aware of, they can default or make their own rules as they went. Uh, how often, uh, Mr. Heskin, do merchant cash advance companies fully and fairly disclose the true cost of capital associated with their cash products? I, I, I think it's fully disclosed as the cost. What I don't think is disclosed is the true nature of the transaction and the APR. If you were to put the APR on that contract, it'd be 2,000%. No one in their right mind would mm -hmm. sign it. Thank you. Um, Mr. Har Professor Harvey, by not disclosing the true cost of capital, such as the excessive interest rates, can it be said that these merchant cash advance companies are not dealing in good faith with small businesses? Yes, that can be said. It's something we would never tolerate in the consumer transactional environment. Um, Mr. Heskin, many of the small businesses you represent do not have in-house general counsel or large legal departments. We have also heard that small businesses are entering into these agreements when they are most vulnerable. Basic contract law requires that parties have equal access to information and one party is not under duress. Does the relationship between the parties and the circumstances small businesses enter these transactions justify prohibiting confessions of judgment in commercial lending. Absolutely. The whole purpose of the usury laws is to protect the necessitous debtor against the, their own desperation. There is absolutely no bargaining power whatsoever. These are take it or leave it contracts. If you want the money, sign it. Thank you. Mr. Harvey, on that same question, any comments? Uh, I fully agree with Mr. Heskin. Thank you. Um, now my time has expired, and I recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to start with Mr. Picker, if I can. Um, as, as members of Congress, um, we often look at how states uh, are approaching and dealing with various issues. Um, you mentioned uh, this briefly during your testimony. Could you uh, review with us again how confessions of judgment uh, work in Pennsylvania at this time? Yes. Uh, the process is when there's a default, the plaintiff will file the confessed judgment along with a complaint laying out the allegations that uh, underlie the default and the basis for the default. Uh, notice uh, must be sent to the defendant and 
uh, they are given 30 days to challenge that. Uh, I will uh, submit, though, that sometimes that notice uh, is only sent out along with a writ of execution, uh, whereby assets can be frozen or taken uh, in the meantime. Uh, and the 30-day period begins to run at that point. Of course, the defendant does have the opportunity to go into court once they receive notice of that and obtain relief. Um, the defendant, during that 30-day period, can file a petition with the court uh, seeking to strike or open the judgment. It can be stricken if there's a defect on the face of the documents. It does not comply with Pennsylvania law in some way. Uh, or it can be opened uh, and then litigated in due course like any other litigation matter uh, if the defendant can show to, uh, to the court that they have a meritorious defense. Okay. Let me, Professor Harvey, let me move to you. I mean, in your testimony, you stated that California has uh, a different approach Yes. Um, when it comes to confessions of judgment, could could you share with us uh, how uh, what the difference is, how it's administered in California? Uh, thank you for the question. So California uh, takes a more thoughtful approach than many states. They require essentially that an independent attorney uh, it advise the debtor before signing an instrument that has a confession of judgment. In addition, uh, the confession must be under oath. Those two provisions uh, sort of heighten uh, and call to attention to both parties what the provision is and, and how it works and serve as a safeguard uh, to make sure that both sides who sign understand what it might uh, do. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I'm going to start with Mick, Mr. Picker, and then I'll go down the line, anybody that would like to, uh, to comment on this. Um, how can we stop the abuses that we've heard about here today? And I'm, we're particularly, you have a particularly sympathetic uh, case, Mr. Bush, and we're certainly sorry to hear uh, about what you and your family had to go through. Um, how can we stop the abuses, but at the same time um, keep whatever positive aspects there are here? And my, my, I guess my thinking would be the, the situation would be, um, A, you're trying to save a lot of attorney's fees uh, by keeping out of court uh, to begin with, you have a business that needs a loan, but for whatever reason uh, is having challenges getting a more standard type of loan, so they use this as a mechanism. Um, and I would assume that there are, there are businesses, I would assume it's the majority, although that may not be the case, that ultimately uh, don't fall behind and don't have a terrible experience and, and get out of whatever their challenge was without the devastating thing that happened to Mr. Bush, for example. So how do we how do we get rid of the abuses but keep whatever positive aspects? And I'll go with you, Mr. Becker. I, I believe there's a couple options. Uh, one would be to completely outlaw them in the MCA small business situation. Uh, another would be to do a better job of ensuring that the small business uh, is aware of the provision and, and what it means. Um, ways that that could be accomplished would be making sure that the provisions are capitalized and bolded, uh, making sure that there's a plain language disclosure, perhaps on the first page of the contract and immediately above the signature line that in plain language, language explains what this means to the small business owner. Uh, another option which New York has undertaken is uh, maybe the New York model, uh, where confessions of judgment can only be filed in the state where the uh, small business is uh, located. Okay, thank you. Mr. Heskin? These transactions I think your mic might be off there. Yeah. These transactions involve interstate commerce. They're wires from state to state. Regulation and licensing. If someone has to worry about their license being revoked or reporting to a regulator, then they'll be a little bit more cognizant about abusing it. Thank you. Mr. Bush? Um, the biggest thing I would say would be for is again, um, will be stopping for us where they can do anything they want to. Have some kind of a law or something there basically says that they just can't go in and take your account or change a contract as they want to. Okay, thank you. And Professor? Thank you. I think the California approach is one way, but I also think uh, the FTC, with its substantial ability to have fines for transactions that violate its rules, is another way, the same way it might work in COPA, for example. Thank you very much. My time's expired, Madam Chair. Gentleman's time has expired, so now we recognize the gentle lady from Kansas, Ms. Davids. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, 
I'd also like to thank you for calling this hearing today. First off, Mr. Bush, thank you for sharing your story. Um, it's, uh, it, it is exactly the kind of thing that members of Congress need to hear the real life impacts of the policy that we are gonna be um, voting on and legislation that we're passing. So I appreciate you um, being so candid uh, with, your, with your story. Um, you know, I, I represent the Kansas City metro area on the Kansas side, and unfortunately, we know uh, a lot in our area about the wide-ranging wide effects of predatory lending. Uh, we've seen payday lenders prey on, on financially vulnerable people in, in the district I represent, and it hurts a lot of individuals and businesses alike. Uh, the issue that um, I'd like to address or... or hear more about, uh, Mr. Harvey, uh, you have spoken, um, uh, or at least, you know, you've, you've given testimony and as a, uh, a law professor, I think you can probably speak pretty clearly to the, uh, due process, uh, issues that, that come up and then, uh, what the chairwoman referenced earlier about a meeting of the minds when it comes to, uh, contracts and, uh, when we think about the small business owner who is an expert, certainly in in plumbing or um, other areas, we know that those folks are often depending on others to help with the legal expertise. So when we talk about sophistication, there is sophistication in a lot of areas. It just might not be around uh, what they have a right to in a contract. So could you talk a little bit about um, about what that means and what we need to be thinking about as we go forward and, and the expectation for small business owners? Thank you for the question. I, I think uh, where we begin is acknowledging that, that TILA was designed for consumers. And, and so because Congress uh, chose to largely exempt business transactions from that framework, uh, courts have therefore had a heightened interest in evaluating fairness in consumer credit transactions and thus by default uh, a, a very small uh, emphasis on uh, sort of evaluating the fairness and due process in, in, in commercial transactions. Uh, you know, I, I think the proposed legislation is, is one way to, to bridge that gap. By treating us businesses the same as consumers, it would be the beginning of courts perhaps evaluating businesses under the same standards that consumer law has applied for the last 50 years. So I think that that's one step. You know, an additional step might be, for example, having dollar thresholds for transactions. That would be another way you might accomplish the same goal. Yes, um, large banks having leases with large companies for hundreds of millions of dollars might not need the consumer the protections that smaller businesses might have. And so there could be a gating mechanism in a regulation or law that would help to achieve that as well. And finally, on due process, yes, the Supreme Court and many courts and members of Congress have defaulted to the view that all businesses are sophisticated, right, and aware, and read contracts. And it's been said earlier, that's that's simply not the correct view. And I, I think changing the law is one great step towards changing that view and changing court's evaluation of such provisions. Thank you. To follow up on uh, the comment you just made about the thresholds, uh, can you tell me a couple other, other and this is open to uh, all, all, all the folks giving testimony today, what other factors might be, um, might be beneficial for us to think about as far as when when a court is evaluating whether or not uh, there was a meeting of the minds and whether or not there's due process, uh, dollar thresholds is, um, is one interesting point. Are there others that you might all recommend? Sure, I think we could focus on the, the size of the business. We could evaluate um, bargaining power. Um, after the fact, much like we would do in unconscionability analysis in consumer law. To be fair, I think the danger with that is we, we don't want um, everyone, regulators, evaluating all transactions after the fact. And so I think there would need to be some objective criteria that specified when a transaction like this was too unconscionable in the business sense. Um, so for me, I think the safest default um, would either, to, either be to outlaw them entirely, to have a getting mechanism with money, or to establish some basic due process that might involve review by an independent attorney, uh, which again would be one additional way in which courts could be confident that the signers had a chance to evaluate the terms. And, and Mr. Haskin, go ahead. one last comment. If one of the other things that would be helpful is to combat the collection practices against small businesses, and so whatever whatever threshold 
the Congress believes should apply, it, it would be helpful if the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act applied to those small businesses. Thank you. Uh, I yield back. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the gentle lady's time has expired. She just yielded back. Uh, now we recognize uh, Mr. Golden uh, from Maine for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to thank you as well for holding this hearing. You know, just following up on Congresswoman David's uh, testimony. I, I think it's on, sorry. Uh, I, I do just want to point out so much in policy making. I think in instances like this, it, there's always this question of who can afford legal counsel and who can't. Uh, and I think that's particularly true when you're talking about businesses and the size of, uh, of their, uh, you know, assets uh, or, or even, you know, whether they have counsel on staff or, or not. So I just throw that out there. I hope it's helpful. But uh, Mr. Bush, uh, you know, I, I want you to, uh, I want to thank you for, for your testimony and, and, and say that this is something that is fairly, I think, common uh, in other areas too. As a veteran, I can tell you there's no, seen no shortage of predatory lending off of military bases and, and others in, in the ways that people get, um, you know, backed into corners and it can really have a massive impact on, on their lives, on their families' lives. On, on their ability to do their job, to be focused on their job, to deploy downrange and defend our country without worrying about what's going on back home in their bank accounts and in their families' lives. And I think it's important for people to understand the context of w what is worst about these types of practices. So I wanted to ask you uh, if you would uh, perhaps share with us a little bit more some of the consequences for you and your family in, in particular. Um, uh, how has the, this ordeal impacted your family beyond what you've already shared with us? Well, basically what it done was when our accounts got froze and everything, I couldn't pay health insurance. At the time, my wife is still um, getting treated for cancer. Um, they was taking every account they could do. Um, we had, like I said, basically go back work for other people, and um, it just it, it hurts your name. I mean, it just it, it, and then the threats never stop. And I still have threats today. Um, I actually had threats the past three, four days um, by just, just coming up here. Um, and like Mr. Um, these two gentlemen, like I said, all you gotta do is just push that button, and they they, they have you. That's right. Um, just a, a follow up to I, I understand that you have an 18 year old son uh, planning on uh, continuing his education. Um, I imagine that this is going to be a potential problem as well. Uh, it is. Um, again, like I mentioned earlier, I cannot even have a bank account. I cannot have nothing in my name, a check card, anything, because um, every time I try to do something, even have a cosign, um, they come after me. It never stops, and then, like I said, this business, business was for him, too, and for him to grow his family, and all this we lost just by push of a button. Yep. Well, what, you're doing the right thing by getting behind the microphone to, to talk about this and, and spread the word. Uh, I've seen a lot of other veterans uh, do this type of thing uh, to, to help people understand uh, why, you know, this is not is not right and, and how it's taken advantage of people. So I want to thank you for that. It takes a, a, a lot of courage, but it is important. And the threat aspect of it, uh, it is really, I think, what is most disturbing. I know what, I, I have seen people overseas uh, picking up sat phones and spending their time instead of calling their families, uh, trying to, to deal with these types of things and the threats that are coming in against their families. And that's when you know someone's really predatory, is when they're willing to look past all those types of uh, factors and, and just uh, resort to threats you know that their intent was always not good. Um, I think just to you know pivot in a different direction, direction, uh, Mr. Picker, uh, as an attorney, uh, just from a practical perspective, what what alternatives exist for a client who wants the security of a confession of judgment? Well, one thing that was mentioned by Mr. Heskin is the ability to obtain a security interest through the Uniform Commercial Code against assets that could include bank accounts. It could include other assets of the business cash flow. Um, and as Mr. Heskin said, there can be some of the same impacts and dangers associated with that as there is with confession of judgment because it is fairly easy to execute on that UCC process. Um, other than that, um, you really have the same remedies once you obtain a judgment through the ordinary course of litigation that you would after a confession of judgment. You're just given the opportunity to contest the matter beforehand. Uh, so once you obtain a judgment, you can do a lot of the, really all of the same things. You can 
uh, have a writ of execution issued to obtain access to a bank account, seize assets, uh, so on and so forth. So in other words, for, for those uh, uh, lenders and people that actually want to help small business owners uh, while also having some uh, protections for themselves, there are other means uh, that, that are uh, not as, as bad and, and potentially um, you know, ripe for abuse than, than this. There are, uh, although I would say they're not certainly not as expedient uh, and certainly likely to be much more expensive to the lender, but yes, they exist. Well, thank you. I mean, clearly this has been very expensive to Mr. Bush and his small business and family. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. The gentleman yields back, and we're going to go into a second round. I, I'm going to, um, I just need to ask two questions, and, and then we'll recognize the ranking member. Mr. Um, uh, Mr. Speaker, the terms of many merchant cash advance agreements require daily repayment. Uh, that means one missed daily payment can result in default, thereby triggering the confession of judgment clause. Doesn't this potentially set up for eventual default the many small businesses in our economy with less steady or predictable cash flows? Uh, I cannot say that I'm an expert on the small mm -hmm. business loan or MCA industry, uh, but having a provision that requires daily repayment certainly increases the risk of default. If you miss just one payment on a daily basis, that is certainly a danger. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Heskin, do you have an estimate of how much small business capital has been lost nationwide as a result of these confessions of judgment? If not, can you give an estimate of how much money your clients have lost? I, I can't give an estimate nationwide, but I can give an estimate as to my clients. Mm -hmm. When these COJs are entered against them, they lose everything. They're, they risk their home, their family, their retirement funds. When they get trapped in the cycle of debt, by the time they come to me, there's no money to like, even hire an attorney. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I now recognize the ranking member. Thank you, Madam Chair. I won't take the, the full five minutes. Mm -hmm. I just had a question, and I guess this was this is kind of for our staff as well, not necessarily for the the uh, panelists here, unless they would know what I'm going to ask offhand. And that's that. I'd I'd be interested to know just how common confessions of judgment uh, confessions of judgment are uh, in the commercial world nowadays, particularly with respect to small business. In other words, how many are there out there? nationwide in, in a typical year's time. Did, do you know, Mr. Heskin? I, I can answer it this way. Okay. Our firm represents big businesses. They, they represent real estate transactions and, and legitimate transactions, legitimate commercial transactions involving millions of dollars where there are sophisticated business or attorneys on the other side, big dollar money. It's used all the time, and it's used effectively. Mm -hmm. But it's when you don't have the representation of counsel. When you don't have the bargaining power, you don't have the ability to negotiate, that's where it gets abused. Okay, thank you. Uh, what I'm asking, Professor, did you want to? Uh, thank you, yes. Um, I think this would be a great opportunity for the CRS to get involved in further research in this space. The truth is that the Bloomberg study, for example, you, you have to go to the county level. You have to do ground level research in many cases, and so that's simply too exhausting and expensive for any, let's say, academics or other interested parties to do, certainly nationwide. It would take a, a massive amount of resources to go to each uh, county courthouse, run through all the records, and evaluate them. And so I think that's one reason why we can't say with any certainty about the scope of the problem. Okay, well the reason for asking the question I, is that, you know, how many are there out there? How common is it? What are the benefits of it? In other words, um, it, it, we I think this is, probably done not just to rip off small businesses or the public. I'm, I'm assuming that there is a positive aspect of this out there that's an, enabled this practice to, to go for quite some time, since the 1400s, I think we heard, or something like that. Um, and and how, you know, how common, to the extent I'm talking percentage-wise, are we talking 1% of these, are we talking 10% of these, are we talking 0. Point something percentage of these that really ultimately do end up in in something that, that is very detrimental to a person like Mr. Bush here? Um, and, uh, and how many of them is it a situation where 
this business literally wouldn't have been able to get the loan to continue or to expand or grow or whatever. Um, and so they actually serve uh, a purpose. And, and I, I don't know if I, I mean, we certainly know that uh, Mr. Bush's evidence of that, that, that somebody can really be hurt by this. Um, what is the benefit of these things? And then is there a, a reasonable way that, that we can modify this, either that the states educate themselves more and do it at the state level, or we decide at the federal level uh, that we need to take this over for whatever reason. Um, so that's that's really what I'm asking, and I don't know if I necessarily want. Well, I guess I do, Mr. Haskin. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead. I, I I think it's less than one percent. If I had to to estimate it, I think it's less than one percent of transactions. Right. And where it would be useful, if at all, is in the context where someone's actually already defaulted and they're giving separate consideration. So I've already breached the contract and I've got a judgment against you already. And I say, I'm, I'm going to forbear on my enforcement activities. And if I do, I'm going to be able to enter the COJ and, and exercise my rights. That's, that's Obermeyer. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Picker, would you want to comment on, on that or? Um, I, I would agree it's probably less than 1%. Um, but that being said, and in my practice... Just to be clear, are we saying the 1% is uh, where it's been abused and it's a problem? Or are we saying in the number of commercial transactions that we have a confession of judgment? Yeah, no, the number of commercial transactions uh, where I see confessions of judgment being utilized. Um, although I, I must say, we do, I do use them. Uh, we, we represent a lot of commercial landlords. Um, and we do generally use confessions of judgment uh, in those contexts without abuse. Uh, and I, I would agree, though, that certainly a situation where a, for instance, a tenant has defaulted or someone under a promissory note has defaulted already, and as, a, uh, as part of a forbearance agreement, if there isn't a confession of judgment already, I think it's an appropriate use of one in that situation uh, because you're helping them out, and you, you should have a little bit more security uh, if they do default again under that forbearance. Thank you. Mr. Bush, I think you were trying to get something in there a minute ago. I don't want to. That's fine. I was going to say something real quick. Um, sure. As far as contractors, like that, we have to have a license. We have to take classes, stuff like that. I think these loan companies or funding companies all be able to turn around and, and have certain type of classes, certain rules, or certain you know things they do because these companies are growing like crazy. I average 20 calls a day from different companies trying to fund me after we've already been closed for a year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I said I went in to take up the five minutes, and I took five and a half minutes. I apologize and yield back. Gentleman's time has expired, and now we recognize uh, the gentleman from Maine, Mr. Golden, do you have any other questions? Sorry, I thought uh, I thought Dr. Joyce was up. Um, I'll, just a couple of, of quick ones too, um, Mr. Heskin. You've you've seen a lot of this. Obviously, you fought these in in, in court on numerous occasions. Uh, can you tell us just a little bit more, uh, just to help us see the the bigger picture, how MCAs are, are marketing to small business owners? Uh, you know, wh what's their point of contact? Are they using salespeople? Are they working with other people? Are they on the internet? Uh, you know, how how are they finding uh, small business owners to sell their product to, and, and under what context? All of the above. They 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 use third party brokers, which are called ISOs, independent sales offices, and. You don't need a license. You don't need any financial experience. In fact, many of, in my experience, many of the people that are doing this have absolutely no financial experience whatsoever. They call you up. They say, I'm a small business expert. Take these funds. It's going to help grow your business. They fund you, and the next thing they know, they ghost you. You're gone, and they collect a 10% premium on the money they fund you. And, and then, then what happens is after, and, and this is how they get the leads, is UCCs. Once they see that one MCA company has issued a loan to them, they can go and find, the, through a UCC search, who's, who's in need of money. And so they cold call them. And my clients get calls 50 times a day. It's nonstop. It's, it's emails. It's cold calls. They even cold call my clients after I've sued them offering to give them more money, saying, you've been such a great client, take out more money. And meanwhile, I'm in lawsuits with them. It's crazy. And they're calling people who are under a lot of financial stress, obviously. So 
Absolutely. Yep. Uh, uh, last question, and then I'm uh, I'm done, uh, Mr. Harvey. Uh, the Merchant Cash Advance companies are marketing products uh, as business loans. Um, I'm not aware of any bank that can uh, make a loan that has a 400% interest rate. Uh, other than limiting confessions of judgment in, in these kinds of commercial transactions, should Congress be looking at regulating uh, mm -hmm. the conduct of, of MCAs in, in general? And, and should there be some kind of uh, rules around interest rates uh, and, and, and what they're able to, to sell? Well, as you know, there are substantial barriers uh, to regulating interest rates at, at this level. None, nonetheless, um, I, I think there's there's good evidence that uh, states that have uh, unlimited, more or less, interest rates are allowed to port into right other states that don't have them, exacerbating this problem. That's certainly true. I think MCAs can be regulated as quasi-financial institutions in certain ways that we regulate large national banks. Um, and I certainly think that, that one effective way to do so uh, is more transparency. Uh, you know, I think part of what's happening here is that people are learning that one company might have 12 different DBAs, right? And it's shining a, a light on who they are uh, would certainly help consumers be more aware of, of what they're doing. Thank you. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. And now we recognize Dr. Joyce of Pennsylvania, 13, ranking member of the Subcommittee on Rural Development, Agriculture, Entrepreneurship, and Trade for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman, and thank you, Ranking Member, member Stephen Chabot. First of all, I'm proud to see Pennsylvania so represented here on this uh, hearing today, and I know that our insights uh, are important. Mr. Picker, I'd like to address these questions with you, if I may, please. Does the Federal Trade Commission currently have any tools to police some of these incredibly unfair and deceptive acts and practices? Uh, unfortunately, that is not within the area of my expertise. Perhaps Mr. Harvey could uh, speak better to that. Mr. Harvey, would you please comment? Uh, I would say the short answer is very, very limited tools. Okay. And for all of you to please answer, you have mentioned that some of the states have instituted safeguards, that the guardrails to protect against the bad actors are in place. How effective have these safeguards been? Mr. Harvey, I'll ask you to answer first, please. Thank you. I think the short answer there is we don't fully know uh, because so much research hasn't been done. We can say that uh, when, when the Bloomberg article came out, we paid more attention to New York because that was one of the few times which we had ample evidence and a deep dive into research. I would suggest that by default, all guardrails are somewhat uh, designed to be useful safeguards. And so as states have more guardrails, you would expect to see confessions of judgment being abused less. But I don't think we can be certain. I think it's an area in which we need more research to be certain. So implementing additional guardrails might not solve the problem without, without researching or studying further. I think it would be fair to say that we do know that some things do reduce transactional error. We know that fully reading and acknowledging agreements uh, makes it more likely that consumers and businesses will pay more attention and make better choices. I think forcing uh, bigger disclosure calls more attention to terms. I think those things always work, and they would work here as well. But I also think it's true that we don't have a, a science for proving how effectively it would work in this case. And so, yes, more research is definitely needed. Mr. Bush, in your experience, would you like to comment on that, on additional safeguards in, in the states of implementing them? Do you see impact? I will see impact if we have more guards. But I guess the biggest thing we do right now is just more education far as, you know, let everybody know, say, hey, you know, these loans out here, double check. Not all funding companies are bad, but just more education and watch out for the ones that there are. So is my take-home message to this committee hearing today that there are not all bad actors, that education might be a bigger role than I came in here understanding? Mr. Bush. Yeah. Okay. Well, what I'm saying is that I'm not saying that all funding companies are bad. What I'm saying is that we need certain more education, and this is just from my part, right. as far as being a contractor or a person taking these loans, is, you know, more education as far as, you know, let people know that, you know, if you do have a judgment, you know, they can do more. Do not go by what the broker says. You know, you cannot go by exactly what he, he or she says. I understand. Mr. Heskin, would you like to weigh in on this, please? Sure. States do put in safeguards, they ban COJs. But there's one problem, the full faith and credit clause. They can ha enter a judgment in New York, even though it's illegal to do it. It's 
void the minute the ink hits the paper in Massachusetts? Doesn't matter. They get the judgment in New York. They can domesticate it to Massachusetts. And even though it's against a boring to their strong public policy, they have to honor it. So there are safeguards. States don't want these, but they're forced upon. Mr. Picker, would you like to weigh in on these safeguards? Yes, and just to clarify, um, the reason that they can go ahead and file in New York where everybody's in Massachusetts is these contracts oftentimes will have a choice of venue or jurisdiction provision which allows them to do that. Uh, that being said, I, I don't know that I agree or disagree with Mr. Heskin's full faith and credit uh, position there. Um, many states uh, have statutes or, or have, have held that, courts have held that uh, confessions are against public policy. Uh, and I do believe that where a judgment, such as confession of judgment, would be against the public policy of the state where it's being transferred to, uh, and maybe Mr. Harvey could speak better to that, I do believe that they do have a option to not recognize that judgment. Mr. Harvey, would you like to weigh in on that? Yes, briefly. I, I think the civil procedure issue is, is alive and well, and, and states uh, have not agreed. I'd also like to add one final thing, if I may. Uh, I recognize that it's been hotly disputed, but the CFPB's consumer complaint database did shed a lot of light on consumer practices. There could, in theory, be a uh, large database of complaints by businesses that had experience with large uh, MCAs. That transparency might help to reduce bad actors in that industry as well. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank you for traveling here from Pennsylvania. Madam Chair, I yield. The gentleman yields back. Well, let me take this opportunity to thank all of you for being here today and shedding light into an issue that I believe uh, the federal government uh, should play a role to make sure that businesses, particularly small businesses, are protected. And, uh, and it means that we have a lot of work to do. I am pleased this committee took the time to shine a much needed light on this practice, especially as Congress looked to act quickly to prohibit confessions of judgment and extend protection to small business owners in commercial transactions. I will also ask unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statement and supporting materials, materials for the record without objection, so ordered. And if there is no further business to come before the committee, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.